Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. We're on Detroit's east side. You can see on this porch, children were playing last night. You can also see where, look at this, shots were fired right at them. Have been completely dry. What are our chances of seeing thunderstorms as we get later on into tonight? All right, Ben, but we begin with breaking news. We're following from Monroe. Daniel Clay sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder of Chelsea Brooke. Thanks for being with us at four o'clock. We heard from Chelsea's mother and her forgiveness of Daniel Clay. And now we're getting to see for the first time the emotion inside the courtroom since the judge would not allow us to air a live video of the sentencing. We bring in Jason Colthorpe from Monroe. Jason. Justice for Chelsea completed today, guys. Now 990 days after she went missing. And you can imagine this emotional roller coaster it's been for people in this community, her family. We saw a lot of it when Clay was convicted. And of course, today, while there were some tears, there were a lot more joyful hugs, handshakes, and smiles. Daniel Clay's life sentence for murdering Chelsea Brooke was expected. His exchange with Chelsea's mom, Leanda, was not. I will live with this for every day for the remainder of my life. It'll be something that I will wake up thinking about, something that I will go to sleep thinking about. We've done that for 33 months. I'm really sorry for everything. Clay's apology meant nothing to the judge. What's very clear to me, Mr. Clay, you're a liar, a rapist, and a killer. 22-year-old Chelsea Brooke was last seen at a Halloween party October 26, 2014. Around 3 a.m., Clay gave her a ride home, and she was never seen again. Six months later, her body was found in a remote wooded area of northern Monroe County by a homeowner. A long and exhaustive investigation ended with the arrest of Clay on July 22, 2016. After a six-day trial, he was convicted of first-degree murder May 16th. We still expect her to walk in the back door. Afterward, Chelsea Brooks' mom talked about being able to forgive Clay. I knew that if I did not forgive him, it would destroy me. It would eat away at me. And as I said in the courtroom, we all have to stand before our Lord someday and answer for what we did and did not do. And throughout what she said in court and afterward, you can tell Leanda and Matt Bruck leaning heavily on their Catholic faith through all of this. She also had a lasting message in this, and that is don't leave your friends alone, referring to what Chelsea went through at that party. Don't leave your friends alone, and if you see something, say something. And it's also important to note how many law enforcement and prosecutor employees were at the sentencing today showing their support, a lot of them who've become very close with the Bruck family throughout all of this. We're in Monroe, Jason Coulter, Local 4. Jason, though, we also need to mention Daniel Clay is also facing charges in a separate uh, rape case. He is. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, before he goes away and is never heard from again, he will be sentenced for that. He was found guilty. He'll be sentenced uh, August 16th for a uh, being convicted of criminal sexual conduct in the first degree, a similar case. Not a stranger, but someone he barely knew that happened after he murdered yeah. Chelsea Brock. Yeah. All right, Jason. Kim? Well, this house on Detroit's east side targeted by shooters late last night, but here's what they probably didn't know. There were eight children inside when the bullets started flying. The shooting happened a little after 11 last night on Grayton. That's near Outer Drive in Cadju. Sean Lay spoke to the grandmother who was babysitting the kids when it all happened. Kids playing on a porch on Detroit's east side. It should be a safe place for them, but follow me here. One shot, two, three, four, five, 28 fired here in all. Gunshots start flying through the house. I end up falling down the step. Sherry Whitman tells me she is still shaken. She is pointing out to us where a hail of gunfire hit her home on Detroit's east side last night. Here, here. It was hot last night and the kids were playing on the porch. Two cars rolled up on Grayton near Warren and people inside both vehicles started firing. Whitman's daughter hitting the ground outside and screaming at those shooters kids here. There's nobody here. Who are you looking for? And they just start, they just open fire again. It was 28 casings out here. 28 shots fired in all right above where the kids were playing on the porch. It's horrible. Along with the kids, four adults were home at the time. It's remarkable no one was hit. Just like I said, we don't bother anybody, so I don't know who the target was for or what was going on. I really don't know. 
Why was this family targeted for this shooting? That is the question tonight. I want you to look at your screen and look at this. The grandmother got a very good look at both cars that stopped right in front of the home and unloaded those shots. One is a gold Jeep Cherokee. The other is a darker color, which she believes is a Monte Carlo. Police are looking for those suspect cars right now. Witnesses did not get a good look at the gunman. Back to you. Just unbelievable. Sean, what about the children? Are they still in that home and how are they doing? Absolutely not, even though their toys are there. The grandmother, first of all, moving today, but the first thing she moved, those kids out of the home yeah. to safety. She thinks it's mistaken identity. She does not want these guys coming back, and if they do, she doesn't want the kids to be there. Yeah, she must be scared to death. Okay, Sean, thanks. Well, we dodged a bit of a bullet last night, the uh, severe weather holding off. You're right, but uh, we haven't been able to shake this muggy, oh, muggy, wow. nasty heat. Let's get over to Ben with the uh, miserable conditions here, Ben. Hey guys, yeah, it's just weighing on us out there, but still unstable enough to at least pop a couple thunderstorms. Most of those are in our north zone right now. We've seen a couple lightning strikes, but mainly these are downpours, and we'll probably see a few more of these continue as we get through the evening. But we look back over the last 40, 48 hours, most of us have seen plenty of rain. The green shades are one inch plus. Some spots like up here around I-69 this morning, two to three inches of rain is what they picked up. So a lot of us have said, Said, okay, we're pretty much done with that. Luckily, we've got a mostly dry seven day forecast. Temperatures drop tonight, and so does that humidity finally. We'll tell you how long it stays away coming up in a few minutes, guys. Ben. Police in Farmington Hills are investigating a serious crash between a driver and a bicyclist. Accident happened at the intersection of Farmington and Tulip Wood Roads this morning. A 73 year old man was riding his bike when he was struck by a 50 year old Novi woman driving her car on Farmington Road. Both the man and woman were transferred to the hospital and we await word on their conditions. Now to a massive nationwide dragnet. The Justice Department is calling the largest operation of its kind in U.S. history, and part of it is centered here in Metro Detroit. Yeah, this surrounds the opioid epidemic and health care fraud, and the numbers are pretty staggering. Consider 412 arrests nationwide. That includes 56 doctors targeting 200 clinics. The DOJ says they are responsible for $1.3 billion in fraudulent transactions. We bring in Rod Maloney, who is at well, one of the clinics targeted the sweep in Farmington and Rod the feds say a group of doctors was responsible for a major chunk of this. That's right Devin in fact it was operating behind the door of this clinic right here in Farmington but it was much much bigger yes they were talking opioid abuse and that's one corner of this but they're saying that this clinic and a group of other clinics were put together specifically to defraud medicare here is the the indictment and the idea was to essentially just bleed the system of money federal officers raided the fisher building yesterday and attorney general jeff sessions said today that their work accounted for a full 10 percent of the scam's value six doctors are alleged to have operated a scheme in Michigan to prescribe patients with unnecessary opioids, some of which ended up for sale on the streets. A physician group called Global Quality used to operate out of this Woodward Avenue office building. Tri-State Physician Group inside the Fisher Building around the corner next to the Tri-County Physician Group then used the National Laboratories and Tri-County Wellness Massage Therapy and Healthcare Management as, the feds say, a Medicare fraud factory. They say this man, Meshayat Rashid, is the ringleader scamming Medicare for $164 million. Rashid displays his significant wealth on Facebook, too. This is him standing in front of a Bentley sedan in front of a corporate jet, and he offers pictures of himself and a friend getting on national television at the NBA Finals. Front row, very expensive tickets indeed. Now, we visited his West Bloomfield home today, and no one was there. The house certainly large, but not a mansion. The Drug Enforcement Agency's Tim Clanson has a warning. It certainly should be a message to, to any rogue phys physician that they, if they think they're going to get away with it, um, you know, we're coming after you. Well, interestingly enough, Rashid is not a doctor, and there was another man in it with him, a Yasser Mozeb, who wasn't a doctor either. But the doctors involved are named Spelios Pappas, Abdul Haq, Joseph Betro, Tariq Omar, and Mohammed Zahur. And they're saying, the, the DEA is saying that uh, anybody else in this kind of a business should be on alert right now. Back to you. So these were federal charges. We heard the attorney general there, Rod, but what about Michigan? Mm -hmm. 
That's right. And uh, the, the, the attorney general went after a Dr. Najah Rumaya of West Bloomfield, he's a dentist in Berkeley, and he was charged with uh, charging for dental services that were never performed. And also there's a Marie Denard, 31 years old in Macomb County, ran a company called Go Forward Transport, and the state is claiming that she was bilking Medicare for thousands upon thousands of dollars either. So this nationwide sweep is all encompassing and really hit a lot of people right here in Michigan yeah, today. And, and clearly more than one or two outliers. It's uh, pretty broad in its sweep. All right, Rod. The Senate has now unveiled its revised health care plan. The new bill now includes a $45 billion fund to combat the opioid epidemic. It also includes an extension of two Affordable Care Act taxes on the wealthy. If passed, it would eliminate the current mandate requiring people to purchase insurance. A last minute addition from Senator Ted Cruz also allows for cheaper and bare bones policies. The revised plan also keeps in place drastic cuts to Medicaid. Busy news days, the only kind we seem to have these days, and we are just getting started here at 5. That's right, much more ahead here uh, over this next hour of news, including a gruesome discovery in the middle of a Pennsylvania farm. And prison danger, a bombshell report, says a Michigan women's prison is in big trouble because of what guards are not doing. And some bad luck, a lightning strike causes extensive damage to this Lyon Township house. But here's where things get weird. Lightning didn't actually hit the home. We'll explain in just a minute. Hank. And Devin, if anyone out there has been a patient here at the DMC within the last year and a half, or if you use Verizon, your personal information may be out on the internet for everybody to see. What you need to know to protect yourself right after the break. New at six. Did a rare disease kill her or was it her two sons? The Wayne County prosecutor says Vicki Balog is a victim of murder. New details laid out in court today. We'll have that coming up at 6. Jason? It was busy Friday afternoon traffic on this stretch of road in Riverview when all of a sudden a hand came out of a car window and started dropping something. It traumatized the young driver behind it. We'll tell you what it was and how you can possibly help solve this serious case of abuse. All right, Jason, but first to help me Hank alert tonight as two separate data breaches are putting personal information at risk. Yeah. The first, a large scale breach at Verizon affecting millions. The other smaller in scale, but hitting closer to home, a breach of patient information at the Detroit Medical Center. Our consumer investigator Hank Winchester live at the DMC with information that may be critical for you, Hank. Yeah, and Devin and Kimberly, this affecting patients here at the DMC last year and into 2015, actually. As for Verizon, that's affecting customers all over the country, including right here in Detroit. First, the Detroit Medical Center has sent more than 1,500 letters to patients informing them of a protected health information breach. An employee contracted by the DMC gave the data to people not affiliated with the hospital that person no longer working there and does not have access to the facility. The breach affects patients who went to a DMC facility between March of 2015 and May of 2016. DMC now offering credit monitoring at no cost to those affected. For more information, you can call 888-362-3370. Moving on to another breach affecting millions across the country and here in Metro Detroit, Verizon says personal information of 6 million customers has been leaked online. The security issue was caused by a misconfigured security setting on a cloud server. Customers' names, numbers, PIN codes all leaked. The big issue here, those PIN numbers. While no information was stolen, if a scammer gets a hold of those numbers, bank accounts could be in big jeopardy. So if you're a Verizon customer and you've contacted their customer service within the last six months, play it safe. Change your PIN number right now. Change that PIN number and also if you've been affected, Verizon is working to find out who actually is impacted by all this. You may receive a text message alert from Verizon or also an email. We're live here tonight at the Detroit Medical Center in Midtown. Hank Winchester, back to you. And what does the DMC have to say about all this, Hank? Well, Devin, uh, they, they're working too. They've been sending out information to patients who've been affected, letters of apology. They've also been working with the Detroit Police Department to continue the investigation and, and hope to figure out exactly what happened here. Yeah. Back to you. All right, Hank.
Now to some big news today for Metro Airport. You're right. Uh, U.S. Senators Debbie Stabenow and Gary Peters have announced the Wayne County Airport Authority will receive more than $3.4 million to construct a service road and rehabilitate runways at Detroit Metropolitan Airport. Funding comes from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, as part of the Runway Incursion Mitigation Program. Pilot Ben Bailey, you know all about that. Yeah. You don't want to have one of those. No, not at all. Are not good. <laughs> you can see in that picture, though, you can see the humidity almost. It's, it's just like, so thick. You can just like it? a knife yeah. and yeah. smash yeah. at it. Uh, tomorrow, that stuff will be gone. Uh, we're going to see a huge difference by the afternoon. Yeah. Probably not going to help folks who are sleeping without AC tonight. Yeah, yeah, another rough night to go. It's been a long week, and here's where temperatures are at right now. We're in the low 80s. That has not been the problem. This has uh, the dew point. Of course, we don't talk relative humidity uh, this time of year. We talk dew points. Could be confusing to some folks, but this is the best way to communicate just how muggy it is. Anytime this number goes over 70, that's what we classify as tropical feeling air. It's fine if you're on the beach down in Florida on vacation, but when you're trying to go to work and just get things done, this is not good, especially for sleeping weather. Watch what happens tonight. We will see a drop in these dew points as we get towards dawn tomorrow. Still in the mid 60s, what we would classify as muggy, but an improvement over where we are right now, and then we'll continue to see the air dry out as we get into the afternoon. So by the time we get to this time on Friday, much drier air with those dew points around low 60s and should stay that way through much of Saturday. Too. We'll see a little bit more of a spike as we get into Sunday, but let's get through two days of nice stuff first. I'm sure she's had enough of this too <laughs> with that fur coat on. She's probably looking for some drier air. One of our storm pins that we got in from Roseville. Appreciate that shot. Uh, and as the cold front sinks south and allows that drier air to come in, again, just the chance of a couple of thunderstorms rolling through tonight. Most of those have been in our north zone so far, and they should be drying out the later we get tonight. This is 8 a.m. tomorrow. Still Still a lot of clouds around, better chances of getting some sunshine towards the end of the day. Saturday looks a lot brighter as we see uh, almost completely clear skies with that low humidity. This is definitely going to be the pick day of the forecast. And then on Sunday, as this cold front gets closer, we will see that humidity inch back up, but shouldn't be as bad as what we've been through in the last few days. Overnight lows tonight, 68. And with that evening shower or thunderstorm, should be dry in the overnight hours. Tomorrow, high temperatures. What a difference with that low humidity. We'll only see these numbers getting into the mid and upper 70s for highs. 79 in Detroit, 78 officially at the airport tomorrow. South zone temperatures, I think we'll escape 80 uh, down here, even towards the state line. 78 in Lambert to come see you're going to be at 76 tomorrow. Very similar numbers in our west zone, even cooler as you start working your way up towards Fenton and Milford 72 73 for high temperatures tomorrow. Now this will be coming with a lot of cloud cover, but again with that change in humidity, I think we're going to notice a huge difference. Low 80s for both Saturday and Sunday does get a little bit hotter there at the start of next week. But the dew points will be down into the 50s and 60s, so it is going to be a lot drier as uh, we feel a little bit more like Arizona and a less like Florida as we get into next week. <laughs> if That's you want to go home to South Carolina, I you don't need to this go. This is any why I moved. It's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, Ben, thank you. Uh, new here at 5, the Detroit Free Press is catching a whole lot of heat for a small change they made online. What it is and why some say it's a slap in the face to 186 years of history. The first story is from all across Michigan tonight, including a 12 year old boy who sprang into action when something went very wrong at a hotel pool in Mount Pleasant. And that's next. Across Michigan, stories from Mount Morris and the state capitol in Lansing. But let's start this roundup in Mount Pleasant, where a 12 year old boy from Muskegon is being called a hero after rescuing a toddler from a pool. The rescue happened Tuesday night at the Days Inn. Uh, Braden Armstrong went to the hotel's pool looking for something he left behind, and that's when he noticed a small child face down in the pool. And I'm like, man, I, I'm pretty sure I should check him out. He's not going off. So I jumped in and then put him off and then saw that he was unconscious and carried him out. Well, that toddler was a three year old taken to the hospital, but it's expected he's going to be OK. A uh, police say he wandered into the pool area alone. It's funny, Braden's mom says that Braden often forgets his belongings. Fortunately, this time that forgetfulness helped save a life. Uh, people living in parts of Genesee County were left to deal with flash flooding. 
Yeah, that's after severe storm, uh, severe thunderstorms passed through the areas yesterday. Flood water was up over the wheels of cars in Mount Morris Township. And in this video, you can see water also covered part of I-475 in Genesee County. Drivers had to take it easy and slow down while making their way through the floodwaters and the darkness. A state audit finds a women's prison is failing to conduct contraband searches. The prison under fire is the Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility in Ypsilanti. It houses about 2,200 inmates. Auditors examined two five-day periods last year and found nearly a quarter of required prisoner shakedowns and cell searches were not conducted, which makes it easier for drugs to be sneaked in. The prison says it will make sure it's complying with the rules. New at 5.30. A local doctor's office turned their supply closet into something much more. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, see how they're going the extra mile to help their patients and the community. We're walking down Tyrement in the city's northwest side. That right there is an abandoned railway. The city has big plans for that in this whole area, and it mirrors something they've already done. Does this look like a home that was struck by lightning? Believe it or not, it was in a way there was a portion that exploded. There was fire people running out at five o'clock in the morning. I'll tell you what happened here in Lyon Township. It's dinner time. If you think last night's weather didn't pack a punch, just ask the family living in this house. Lyon Township family forced into a hotel for the next few days after lightning from last night's storm sparked a fire in their home. But finding a hotel is a happy inconvenience given that mom, dad, and their two kids got out okay. Nick Monticelli shows us while lightning caused the fire, it didn't hit the home directly. I know it doesn't look like much, but you see that brown triangle just to the right of the garage. On the other side of that is a hall closet. They say it almost exploded. A lightning strike hit, but didn't hit their home, and it hit power lines and then fed in to their home. The smoke alarm was going off upstairs. It is not just a fancy catchphrase. Smoke detectors save lives, and today is a perfect example of it. Around 5 a.m., Kathy Murray was lying in bed. She heard a loud explosion. The power went out but she thought it was all part of the storm until the smoke detector sounded. So I looked upstairs and saw flickering like a candle. It turns out a bolt of lightning hit nearby power lines and fire investigators think the electricity went straight into her home through the wiring, causing an explosion and a fire in a hall closet. The explosion had blown the doors open of the closet and there was a big hole in the wall and flames about probably a foot and a half high were shooting out of the hole. Panic, she screamed for the kids to run. Her husband tried putting the fire out, but it was no use. In the meantime, her daughter Abigail was calling 911. I feel like I was kind of in shock at first because I didn't really understand what was happening. Fire is out and they are now going to start fans to get the smoke out of the house. Firefighters were there in minutes and got the fire out before it spread much further. A terrifying ordeal, considering how much worse it could have been. Very scary because their bedrooms are up there. Very scary. If the smoke detector hadn't have worked, we wouldn't have known. In Lyon Township, Nick Monticelli, Local 4. Yeah, besides the closet, there is some smoke damage in their home. An electrical crew has to come out and test every wire now in their home before the power can be turned back on. Well, the good news tonight is not going to be such serious weather, but you do have some things popping up on radar we need to watch out for. There are lightning strikes out there, and it doesn't take but one right. uh, to cause problems, and that's where we're going to start on 4 Live Radar. These have been really far to the north in our north zone, really north of 69. And this is one of the spots that hasn't been soaked uh, from some of the showers and storms over the last 48 hours. Northern Lapeer County, parts of Sanilac County, and most of this is just downpours. But every so often we picked up a lightning strike here on 4 Live Radar. And we'll probably continue to see a few more of these as we get at least through the evening hours and then things quiet down as we get into the overnight. So here's the bottom line. Humidity dropping tonight, but it's going to be late. So most of the nighttime is still going to be muggy. Weekend is halfway decent and halfway will be the operative word. We'll explain that heating up though next week. We'll look at those temperatures and see how many 90s are in the seven day forecast coming up here in a few minutes, guys. Hey Ben, investigators have discovered human remains on a farm in Pennsylvania that has been the focus now for a while on the search for four missing men. The remains were found in a 12 and a half foot deep common grave. One of the bodies has been identified as 19 year old Dean Finociaro. A 
Authorities have identified 20-year-old Cosmo DiNardo as a person of interest and have been searching part of that 90-acre farm owned by his parents. They're side by side. They're combing through vast fields and buildings. They're down 12 foot deep in a hole that's getting deeper by the minute. DiNardo was arrested earlier this week after trying to sell a car that was owned by one of the missing men. He's being held on a $5 million cash bail. Finichiaro, Jimmy Tarpatrick, Mark Sturgis, and Tom Mio all mysteriously disappeared last week. President Trump and the First Lady on an official visit in Paris today. But even thousands of, miles of away, thousands of miles away from Washington, President Trump still pressed on the issue of Russia. Blaine Alexander is following the story from the Capitol. Blaine. Well, Devin, today in Paris, President Trump confronted the controversy surrounding his oldest son, pushing back on what he calls a big deal over nothing. Special guests in Paris, President Trump and the First Lady welcomed by the President of France ahead of Bastille Day. But amid the pomp and circumstance, President Trump once again forced to answer questions about Russia and his own son. I have a son who is a great young man. He's a fine person. During a joint news conference, President Trump pressed about a campaign season meeting between Donald Trump Jr. and a Russian attorney said to have damaging information about Hillary Clinton. From a practical standpoint, uh, most people would have taken that meeting. That's very standard in politics. Politics is not the nicest business in the world, but it's very standard where they have information and you take the information. And making an unexpected claim, blaming the Obama administration for letting the Russian attorney into the country. Somebody said that her visa or her passport to come into the country was approved by Attorney General Lynch. Now, maybe that's wrong. I just heard that a little while ago. Amid diplomatic talks of a Syrian ceasefire, climate and fighting terrorism, the president defending himself and his family on politics back home. And President Trump went on to say that absolutely nothing came from that meeting, but critics say that the problem is the fact that his son was willing to hold that meeting in the first place. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. All right, Blaine, one other note from today. President Trump also seemed to leave the door open to perhaps rejoining the Paris Accord uh, during his visit, saying something could happen with respect to the global pact, but he also pointed out if it doesn't, that's okay with him too. The condition of Louisiana Congressman Steve Scalise is improving tonight. He has been moved out of the intensive care unit. Congressman Scalise was injured during a shooting at a congressional baseball practice in Washington last month. The shooter was killed by police. Scalise has had several surgeries since he was shot in the hip, suffering extensive internal damage. 20 years ago, it would have sounded like an impossible dream, I think, transforming 26 miles of abandoned railroads in Detroit into bike trails and green space. But bit by bit, it's mm -hmm, happening. Yeah. First, the DeQuinder cut. Now, a $2 million grant could help get the full loop completely transformed. Jamie Edmonds has a look at this generous gift and the huge impact it could have on the city. This is the DeQuinder cut. As you know, it's a former railway turned into a greenway that really is used by a lot of bikers and walkers. This is an area of northwest Detroit that's quite the opposite. Not very many people, not much activity. But if the city has its way, this area could mirror the DeQuinder cut in a lot of ways. This is an, an existing path. Janet Atarian, the deputy director of Detroit's planning and development department, gives the grand tour of the city's new acquired land. We think this could be a really beautiful place uh, to come ride your bike. This 7.5 mile section of the Detroit Terminal Railroad is the missing link to complete the Inner Circle Greenway, a 26 mile non-motorized path around the city. To the east is the existing DeQuinder Cut. To the south is the Detroit Riverwalk. To the west, plans call for the railway to be transformed. Walking trail, biking, benches, we hope to create um, what I would call sort of uh, nodes of interest. So maybe there'll be a place that could be a little bit of a performance space. The Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation gave the city a $2 million grant which will be used for the design of this area. Quinder Cut really started this whole process and I think was really the thing that gave um, not only the city, but I think all of Detroit the confidence that these kinds of projects are, can really work. The whole idea of the Inner Circle Greenway is to connect Detroit residents to each other, to parks, to downtown. We caught up with this man on his bike who believes that is a great idea. What do you think? 
I'm ready for it. Mm -hmm. The city will ask for requests for proposals later this summer. In Detroit, Jamie Edmonds, Local 4. All right, Jamie. Over the past 186 years, albeit with some tweaks over time, this has been the logo of the Detroit Free Press, the old English script, the F coming to symbolize the paper's long legacy. Uh, but yesterday, with no announcement and no fanfare, this logo turned into this logo popping up at the top of the Free Press website. And although the script logo isn't going anywhere on the print edition, we're told, the web page will have this modern looking logo mandated by its owner Gannett. As you can imagine, that change sparked an uproar online. And now after making the switch, even some Free Press staffers are voicing their displeasure. Uh, reporter Teresa Baldus cleared some confusion, saying the Detroit Free Press did not make this decision. Our owners did, and believe me, many of us Freepers prefer our old English font. The school board says elementary students are overscheduled, overworked, and they're over it. New here at 530, the controversial thing they banned in hopes kids will have more time to just be kids. And she was stuck for hours in the middle of the ocean. What this woman said she didn't do before heading out on a jet ski that almost cost her her life. Doc? A local doctor's office turned their supply closet into something special. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, see why they're offering their patients more than medicine and the impact it's already having. I wrote about the origin.